penetrate from the head to the heart. They say the longest distance in the world is from the head to the heart. We need to take these and look at these attributes and really ponder them. That's my Father. That's who wants to take care of me. Now, how does God take care of us? How does he provide for us? We say that he does this through what we call the master plan. And it's a master plan because, number one, it's written up by the master. It's put together by the master God himself. And it's also the master plan because it includes everything down to the smallest detail. And we try to describe this master plan by saying, first of all, it is a plan of love. It is designed completely and exclusively for the personal well-being of his creatures, directing each one to his proper destiny, the glory of heaven. So this master plan that God draws up is all an expression of love. It's only love. And it has one goal, and that is to lead each one of us home to heaven. So we like to look at the master plan as a blueprint, as a carpet or a rug, and as a mosaic. When we look at it, first of all, as a blueprint, we say that God's master plan is like a blueprint of a great architectural work laying out the events of the world and of our own life right down to the smallest detail. We've all seen a blueprint, and we look at this blueprint, we see everything is there down to the smallest detail. That is to go into the building, for example. If something isn't on the blueprint, it won't go into the building. So the architect gives the blueprint to the builders, and if they follow it, the end result will be this beautiful cathedral or whatever as planned by the architect. We take that image and we apply it to God and the master plan. So for example, we can say that before God created us, he went to, the, went to his desk and drew up this blueprint, a magnificent blueprint of each of our lives. And he put on that blueprint everything to the smallest detail that will help us get back to heaven. It's not just the big things, it's every tiny little detail. Down, because he's a father, he loves us, he puts everything in there to help us come back home to him. So it tells us with the blueprint everything is there. We just need to follow it. Well, first of all, we need to discern what's on that blueprint and then to follow it because the end result will be heaven. I have a beautiful experience of this down to the smallest detail. And it's this, we have, what we, we have family retreats at our center. And one weekend we had one of these retreats and I was responsible for the boys. And I had 12 boys between the ages of 10 and six months old. And I was to entertain them for one hour. I did pretty good the first 45 minutes. And then I ran out of something to do. So I was saying to the Blessed Mother, now what am I gonna do for these last 15 minutes? Because this is crucial, 15 minutes can be a long time. So I was praying and thinking about this. I looked over and all the boys were in a big circle in the middle of our conference hall looking at something, and I thought, oh, now what is this? So I went over there, and they had found two ants, and they were following these ants, watching these ants, and when one ant would come close, the little boy would put his hand up, so the ant would have to go in another direction. For 15 minutes, they were entertained with these ants. ants. And I said, okay, from all eternity, God knew that I would need these ants at this moment of time, and so he took care that they would be there. Do you see? Every tiny little detail, that's how much God loves us and how much he wants to take care of us. The blueprint. Everything is there, down to the smallest detail. Then the master plan is also like a rug or a carpet. 
This plan is like a rug which God is weaving for all of us throughout our life. God knows the pattern and the color of each individual thread. During our life on earth, we can perceive only the back of the rug with its entangled threads and can hardly make out the pattern. But we must believe that the great master weaver knows his trade and has created the most perfect design for us. So the second part of this master plan tells us is we are not always going to understand it. We don't have the mind of God, so we're not going to always understand his plan. Many times, or maybe often, our life will look like the underside of the carpet, all tangled and knotted. It just doesn't make any sense. Why this? Why that? But God knows what he's doing. And when we're in eternity, we will see the beautiful plan God has woven in our lives. For example, we know of a mother, let's say, who has five children and she's dying of cancer. Okay, so we pray and we pray and we say, God, put in a red thread and save her life. Work a miracle. And God doesn't. He puts in a green thread and takes her life. Doesn't make sense to us. We can't figure it out. Every child needs their mother, we say. But in eternity, we'll see, if he hadn't put in this green thread, it would have totally altered the plan. But see, we don't see it all. We only see a little bit. And so this part of the master plan, when we see it as a rug, we're going to say, it doesn't, I don't always understand. It doesn't make sense. But this is where we have to have our faith and our belief and our trust that God knows what he's doing. The third aspect of the master plan can be compared to a mosaic or a puzzle. We see only the individual pieces of different sizes and shapes without seeing the full design. It takes our whole lifetime to put the puzzle together. Our human mind is not able to comprehend the reason for each piece and its particular place in the whole layout. It should be enough for us to believe that God knows the design. So this part tells us that we only see a little bit at a time. And when we see a little bit at a time, it doesn't always make sense to us. How do these things fit together? How is this going to work out for my best for all eternity? And there again, we have to have this belief and faith that God knows how these pieces fit together. So this master plan tells us everything is there, the blueprint, everything we need to return home to the Father. The carpet tells us we're not going to understand everything. It's not going to make sense to us. But we have to believe. We have to trust. We have to know who the divine weaver is. And the third, the mosaic, We only see a little bit at a time, and therefore we don't understand how it will all fit together, but God does, and it will all work out in the end. And the last point that we want to look at with this understanding, this master plan, are the four characteristics of this plan. And the first one is that it is universal. And this is very important. Divine providence, this plan, this master plan, is universal and encompasses all events which take place in this world and in the individual life of each one. Everything is part of God's eternal plan for the universe. Nothing happens merely by chance or by accident. Everything is meant to serve a purpose and is foreseen, ordained, or permitted by God. We know that God makes all things work together for the good of those who love him. So this tells us we may never ever say again, oh, that was chance. Oh, that was coincidence. Oh, that was an accident. It wasn't. It's in the plan. Nothing happens outside of the plan. Everything that happens in our life and in the world at large is all part of the plan. It's all part of God's plan. 
So nothing can, we can say, oh, that was good luck. No, it was in the plan. It's all in the plan. I went to New York after 9-11 and I heard some powerful stories of people who were supposed to be at the World Trade Center and weren't. Was it coincidence? It was part of God's plan. Just one example. There was a father who worked at the Trade Center and they had had twins and the twins were up all night and the mother was beside herself and she told her husband, if you go to work now, I, you probably won't find me when you come home. I'm going to lose my mind. And so he stayed home to help her feed the twins, get them settled, and then he went to work. He drove out of the driveway, put on the radio, and as he put on the radio, he heard about the planes going into the World Trade Center. He should have been there. He was not there. Was that an accident? Was that luck? No. It was part of God's plan from all eternity. So everything that happens is part of the plan. It's either his ordaining plan that he wrote into the original plan or his allowing plan, which is affected by our free will decisions and the free will decisions of other people who alter the plan, but it's all part of the plan. God knew it from all eternity, so he put it in the plan. So this plan is universal. The second characteristic, it is infallible. God cannot err. So the plan that drew up, that God drew up, is a perfect plan. And even when our free will decisions affect it, God can take care that it all works out for the best. Then it is unchangeable because God himself is perfect and he does not need to change. Nothing unexpected can ever happen to God nor could anything ever take place which would change his mind. In his master plan, God also foresees all our free will decisions we will ever make, so our actions and prayerful petitions will never disturb or change God's plan. They are simply part of his master plan because God knows all things. So he knows my prayers, he knows my free will decisions, so that's all incorporated in his original blueprint of my life, so nothing needs to change. And the last characteristic is that it is a plan of love. God's providence is a plan of wisdom, power, and love. God is love, he created us out of love, and for the purpose of love. Look at the birds in the sky, they do not sow or reap, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Every hair of your head has been counted. God's loving care for us is even greater than a mother's love for her child. Can a mother forget her infant be without tenderness for the child of her womb? Even should she forget, I will never forget you. So this loving plan is really only there for our very best. That God wants to take perfect care of us out of his infinite love for us. Those, those are the characteristics of this master plan. Universal, infallible, unchanging, and loving. So we see that this teaching on divine providence very clearly shows that God does exist, that God is part of our life, and that he wants to take care of us, and our responsibility is to cooperate with the plan, to try to discern what's on the plan and to follow the plan so that we can reach eternal salvation. As we continue studying divine providence, and we have seen that we said that it is a plan where God has put everything into the smallest detail, then we may ask ourselves, so what about, what about prayer then? Do I need to pray if everything's already planned? And what about my free will? Am I really free then to decide if God has placed everything into the plan? Another question that may come up is we say that it is a plan of love, but then we see evil and we see suffering in our plan and also in the world. And so then we ask ourselves, how do these fit in to God's plan? So now we want to look at each one of these and see how, yes, they are part of God's master plan. 
The first thing we will look at is freedom. We know that God gave us a free will, and therefore we know that God has great respect for our free will. So whenever I am using my free will, even if to do something bad, God does not step in and take it away from me. He allows me to do it. He will invite me not to do it, but if I continue and say, yes, I'm going to do it, he respects our free will. So when God drew up our plan, the, drew up the blueprint of our lives, he had what we call his ordaining plan, his original plan, a beautiful plan for each one of us. And then he did something very interesting. He gave us free will because he wanted us to freely decide to follow him and to follow the plan. He could have done it any other way because he's God. He could have made us, for example, like robots, programmed us, I go do my little thing and you go do your little thing. But he didn't, he made the beautiful plan and then he gave us a free will. And he says to us, please use your free will in the gift of your intellect to discern what is on this plan and then make the decision to follow it. So when I choose not to follow God's plan, he allows me to do so. So let's say, for example, God wants me to go down this road and I want to go down this road. God allows me to go down this road because he allows my, me to use my free will but then he's going to put some type of a roadblock here. Whatever it might be, an inner inspiration, somebody says something to me, or even a tragedy, to get me back on this path. He will never drag me over there. He will invite me to go back. And if I choose to continue going another way, he will continue to invite me back. So what we're saying is, he gave us a free will. He respects that free will. He will never take it away from us. And if I decide to do something different, he allows it. But he's always there inviting me to come back. To come back to following his plan. And he will follow me until I take my last breath, inviting me constantly to come back. But I'm always free to decide to follow him or not to follow him. And this shows us that God has tremendous respect for the gift of our free will. Then let us look at prayer that you find on the bottom of page 104. And to ask, how does prayer fit in to this plan? It says, prayer is a part of God's plan, a part of his providence. For we will only obtain certain things when we ask and pray for them. Ask and you shall receive. So this shows us that prayer is important for several reasons. First of all, it is necessary for our own sake. It makes us reflect upon our great needs and on the goodness of God who is powerful enough to grant us anything we ask for. So prayer, when we turn to God in prayer, we see how, how much we need him and how good he is in answering our needs. Prayer, secondly, also disposes our will to desire only that which God in his love and wisdom has ordained for our best. So prayer is not to change God's mind, but to change my mind. So in prayer, when I ask God for something, I'm receiving the graces to be able to follow His will, saying yes to His will, and not to my will and what I want. Also, as we said, certain things that God will answer or give us are dependent on us praying for them. 
So he puts in the plan, for example, and says, if you pray for this, you will receive it. If you don't pray for it, you're not going to receive it. But we don't know what that is. So we should pray without ceasing. So prayer becomes very much a part of God's plan for us, for our sake, not for his, but for our sake, that he really makes certain things dependent on our asking. It helps us to see how small we are and how great God is and that we want to turn to him again and again. And it gives us the grace to be able to say yes to his will and submit to his will. One very important thing of prayer that we need to think about too is there is no such thing as an unanswered prayer. God answers every prayer. Sometimes his answer is no, but it is an answer. There's the story told of a little boy who decided he wanted a bicycle for Christmas. And the teacher had told him, you just ask God and he will take care of it. You pray, you ask him, you trust. And so this little boy decided, okay, my mother and father can't give me a bicycle because they were too poor, but God can. And so every day he would go to church before he would go to school and he would ask God for a bicycle for Christmas. Christmas came and there was no bicycle. The teacher heard about it and she was a little, oh, how is he going to take this? How is he going to understand all this? And so one day she met him and she asked him, did you get your bicycle for Christmas? No, I didn't get my bicycle. Well, what happened? What do you think happened? And then in all his wisdom, he said, well, God heard my prayer, but he said no, because God knew that wouldn't be the best thing for me, so he had to say no, but he answered my prayer. And that's the beauty of it. God answers every single prayer. Now, how do evil and suffering fit into this plan of love? First of all, evil. We know that God does not want evil. God did not create evil, but he allows it because of free will. And then he makes use of it. God, being the God of love, cannot allow evil for the sake of evil. He has to do something with it. It says here God absolutely does not want sin and evil, but he permits it for profound reasons. And what are these reasons? First of all, he wants to leave every intelligent creature, every human being, the liberty of his action. Free will. That's why God allows evil, because as we said, he respects our free will. So if I choose to perform an evil act, God is right there inviting me not to, but if I continue to do so, he allows it. So he allows evil because he respects our free will. And again, we have to see what a gift our free will is and how we should learn to use our free will in the right way to seek and to fulfill God's will. The second reason why God allows evil, God permits evil not to destroy us, but so that he may bestow his merciful love upon us as he forgives us our sins. When Jesus came to teach us about God as our Father, he also came to teach us that he is the merciful Father. I like to use for myself the image of God like a volcano. He's, you know, when a volcano has the right setting, it erupts. And God is like a volcano of merciful love that wants to erupt, that wants to shower us with his merciful love. And he has that opportunity when I fail, when I sin, and I come back to him. And I'm truly sorry. He forgives me, he envelops me, he has the opportunity to envelop me in his merciful love. And that's what Jesus tried to teach us through the prodigal son. Think of that parable. Here is this young man who did every, committed every sin in the book, and now he comes back to his father. And his father doesn't stand at the doorway with his arms folded and say, now we'll see what he has to say. He runs out to greet him. 
And it was not proper for a Jewish man to run. You know, they had all these rules, and it was not proper. But he ran to embrace his son in mercy. Or we think the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Those who came at the first hour and those who came at the last hour got the same pay. God's mercy. Or my favorite example of God's mercy is the good thief on the cross. The mercy of Jesus at the last hour. You will be with me in paradise. So God will allow all this evil and all this sinfulness so that he has an opportunity to show his mercy when we come back to him. The next reason why God allows evil, he wants to manifest his almighty power on our behalf and therefore derive good from evil. Now this takes a great deal of faith because what we're daring to say is that out of every evil, God brings good. That's hard to understand. The evil of abortion, the evil of child abuse, what good is that? But we have to believe, even though we're not going to understand it or maybe even see it, that out of every evil, God doesn't allow it for its own sake, but out of it, he brings something good. And therefore, he can allow it because he can do something with it. Only God can do that. And the last reason why God allows evil, the sinful action of one person could very well become the cause of rich blessings for others. Now, when I see an evil act in another person, it can be a good example for me to not do that. God doesn't want this person to perform the evil act, but if they choose to do it, God says, okay, I will use that. A perfect example is our story.